uh, my presentation, as you can see, it's work that I've done in conjunction with Bob Lingard. So at this particular point, Bob was had an Australian Research Council uh, grant and he was looking at, uh, he had conducted an awful lot of interviews with the OECD and at that point I did a postdoc with him and um, I decided to look at uh, collecting data uh, from 10 newspapers, um, 10 Australian newspapers, and, and seeing uh, what came out of that. So that's basically what, we're going, what I'm going to talk about today, an analysis of the media portrayals of PISA in Australia <coughs> spanning 2000 to 2014. So, just a little bit of an overview because I am mindful, I, I do have a lot of graphs and I just don't want to lose anyone in the process. So um, I'll start off by looking at some of the previous research. Uh, I'll point out our argument. I'll look at some of the methodologies, our methodological considerations. Um, I'll have a little bit of a talk about uh, from drawing on the interviews with uh, the OECD Media Relations Officer, who was specifically uh, uh, um, had the role of um, uh, disseminating the PISA information. Um, and then I'll move into kind of a context, a demographics of the Australian uh, media coverage, and then quite specifically look at the three frames that um, came out of the analysis. And then, of course, our conclusions. So, when looking at the previous research that was done in this area, I didn't find an awful lot. There were about 20 papers that were in English that were specifically using the print media as a data source. So there might have been other papers that used uh, elements of the print media in passing, but not specifically as a data source. So I thought that was quite limited, quite, quite small, and perhaps, um, you know, uh, should warrant further research. Um, from the studies that I did, um, look at, this is a little bit of a literature review, I guess. So they, they basically were a specific, country, a specific country comparisons or cross-country comparisons. And I've, there's more than this, but I've just listed some of them. And I think it was the um, knowledge, uh, know and poll, the, the project that, um, that had quite a lot of uh, the papers uh, uh, drawn from that project. Um, there seemed to be a propensity towards negative media coverage. Uh, there was a tendency for reportage to focus on simplistic coverage um, that often included league tables and rankings uh, and ratings. The, it, it, the reportage seemed to privilege certain discourses about PISA results, and in so doing, uh, had the potential to frame um, public understandings. So one of the, we, we heard earlier today about the discourses of failure. One of the other discourses was that of crisis. So we seem to see that an awful lot, you know, education systems in crisis. Um, and the media coverage tends to peak at times of perceived crisis. And the results in, in this results in um, policy re reactions <coughs> of scandalization. So for example, um, when there is a gap between the country's own perceptions of their performance and their PISA results, um, you have what is termed as PISA shock. Um, and then the other scenario was when there is slippage. So if a country is doing quite okay and then they slip in the rankings, um, again, discourses of crisis seem to surface. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and there were, we also, in looking at the literature, there seemed to be this practice of external policy referencing and the role of the media in foregrounding reference societies. So um, just, just a little bit of a background there. 
So in terms of our argument, we're saying that increased emphasis and media attention thrusts educational, in, in, educational issues into public awareness. We're saying that enhanced media coverage also highlights the OECD's media strategy for the dissemination of PISA um, results. Um, I found that there were three media frames that the, the Australian press tended to use. That was counts and comparisons, criticisms and context. Um, there, there, of course, is another way of um, referring to those frames, but we liked the CCCC, so we went with that. Um, and also media attention on PISA has policy effects with the emphasis being on uh, quality. So in terms of the OECD, that would mean mean scores rather than equity. So overwhelmingly, except for half of one of the frames, the focus was on quality. So um, <laughs> In terms of the media component of this presentation, I used the Factiva database and I did a keyword search, PISA, and then that, that, drew, about, that drew exactly 462 um, articles. And then there was a process of a three-pass reading, so I would read everyone, eliminating travel to PISA, um, eliminating uh, uh, articles that didn't really uh, weren't PISA, PISA was not the focus of the article it was just that it was used in passing so they they were all eliminated and I ended up with 173 newspaper articles over that 14 year period and it drew from 10 Australian newspapers, two of which were national papers, and the, other, uh, the others were one from each state and territory. And the ownership, predominantly five of the newspapers were News Corp Australia, so the Murdoch Press. Um, four of them were the Fairfax Media, and one was from um, Seven West Media. And in terms of the interviews, uh, Bob had conducted, well, over 16, but at the time of this, uh, it was 16 interviews with the OECD, and we particularly draw on the media relations officer. And in terms of analysing the data, the newspaper and interview data were analysed using a thematic analysis, and then the newspaper data had additional an additional analysis in the form of a content analysis and also a frame analysis. So when I put up all those graphs, that's, that's drawing on the content analysis and then the um, frame analysis, I'll put up some examples of quotes from the newspapers. So in terms of looking, drawing predominantly on the interviews, and looking at the OECD media practices, we have the OECD's understandings of the role of the media, and we have the OECD's own media practices, and they're aimed at moderating the mediatization of PISA. However, they contribute to the phenomenon also. And so, when we spoke, or when Bob spoke to the media relations officer, um, he or she identified their role um, to liaise between the OECD experts and the outside world, and uh, strive to make the work of the, the directorate uh, more appealing to the media. So. He acknowledged the media were more interested in certain sorts of stories and um, the aim was to get the message the OECD wanted to deliver out to the media. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, they did seek to manage the, the media PISA message um, to enhance political impact. So I, I, was, um, I, I was interested before in the comments that 
there was a, uh, apparently Andrea Schleicher seemed to not think that there was any interaction there. Um, one, of, one of the people there did actually mention that. Um, so in terms of the media cycle, just very briefly, so in terms of um, getting their message out to the media, there was, there was this development of a strategy. So the media teams would work with the education directorate on a choreographed release of the PISA results. And the media, the media officers said, we work with Andreas to work out a strategy for releasing it to the media. So then the alerts go out to journalists. So they've got about 4,500 journalists on their books. Um, and so they have contacts globally and they send out information weeks before the December report comes out, informing them that this is coming up. Um, Next, there are lengthy briefings to journalists, um, particularly at the launch. So at this launch, one of the, not the media officer, another OECD person um, indicated that we don't do these big media launches um, because it's a flagship. And in this particular case, it also is seen as breaking news, which is unusual for us. Sorry, I said don't, we do, sorry. We do these big media launches because it's a flagship. And in this particular case, it's also seen as breaking news. Um, and then finally, at the press conference, um, the results are made public at press conferences in Paris and London and Brussels and Washington and other large cities around the globe. And as we heard earlier, there's an 11 a.m. embargo on the release of the results and that gives journalists an entire day um, to prepare their media stories. And so these briefings to journalists about the PISA results possibly, when we've, we've debated this earlier, so possibly seek to manage the media message that gets reported. And, um, or you could possibly look at it as a way of helping to the journalist to interpret the data. So, you know. Um, and so, Again, talking to the uh, media officer in terms of enhancing, enhancing the policy usage and effects of PISA, he stated, if the OECD brings out a report, it is very easy for the government ministers to ignore it or to be told about it by their staff top down. Whereas I am sure with PISA, the fact that it's all over the BBC in England and the education minister is going to be very aware of it, that's why we do it, the dissemination. Um, and so the media relations officer also noted how Schleicher um, used the media to get the OECD media policy across to education ministers um, and to the policy makers as well as the broader public. So someone from the education directorate said, I think this organisation has made PISA more media focused and also more political. Of course, you tend to use that to reinforce the impact. So thinking about or asking the questions, what does he think journalists want? Um, it was obvious there was going to be a league table, but we don't want to encourage people to go down that line because with PISA, the frustration with the league table is even though you have the top five countries or countries with half points difference, there's no difference at all. But the countries still say we are third above X and Y and you can't stop them. And he goes on to say, I wouldn't say we discourage that, but we certainly don't encourage it. It's a lost cause, really. So this is talking about its perceptions of what the media wants, that being rankings and league tables. So 
If I move on to the Australian media coverage of PISA, just to give a little bit of a theoretical grounding into where I'm going. Um, media organisations as policy actors play a distinct role in shaping public realities. And um, they're not independent actors in the field. Their ownership can have political and ideological affiliations. And they undertake a conscious and systematic promotion of particular agendas. And these practices seek to influence the politics and policy. And so with that in mind, I thought it might be a good idea to let you know where Australia stands in relation to that, uh, the um, PISA testing from the time um, from, from the beginning. So initially, um, initially in 2000 and 2003, Australia did quite, quite okay, quite well. But then by 2012, we start to see a decline. And so if you were to compare the scores from 2000 to 2012, um, there was a drop in seven points in science, a drop of 16 points in reading, and a drop of 29 points in, in mathematics. Um, that's based on mean scores. So with that in mind, I'll present some, um, some demographics or some context um, that will give you a little bit of an idea of the newspapers, uh, the, the reportage, the, uh, yeah, just a little bit of information based on the content analysis. So in terms of the percentage of PISA articles um, by newspaper ownership, we have News Corp Australia and Fairfax Media. They were pretty much um, where the main um, reports happened. Um, the Seven West Media had only one newspaper, which I'll show you in a minute. So as you can see, Australia lacks uh, diversity in media ownership. It's very concentrated and that has effects. Um, if I look at the aggregated percentages of the PISA articles um, by newspaper, you can see the red is the News Corp, the blue is the Fairfax Media and the green is Seven West Media. And so these two are national newspapers um, and you can see that the Australian pretty much dominates the reportage. Um, closely, I, well, I guess two and a half times less than that would be the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, both Fairfax papers. Um, the Tasmanian newspaper there, the Mercury, not a mention of PISA at all. Um, so uh, as, as you can see here, there, is, uh, there are a number of points that I want to make. But if we look at the percentage of newspaper articles by year, we can see that there is quite a steady increase um, uh, over the time. Um, and it's been said that that perhaps parallels the, uh, the, the rise of the significance of PISA, um, I guess, in our society. Um, Second point I'd like to make is that reportage peaks during a report year. So the number, the, and you can see there where my arrows are, um, you can see that there is a peak in the year after the, they sit PISA when the report comes out. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the third point that I wanted to make is that you can see in 2004 and then kind of 2012-13 that there are these peaks. Now, um, 2004 perhaps is the time when um, the significance of the test started to become uh, a little bit uh, foregrounded, people became more aware of it. And then in 
2012, 2013, uh, that could be the time after Australia's Pisa shock, when in uh, 2009 and then the 2010 report, we saw um, Shanghai's performance. And that, that was, you'll see in a little while, our PM's uh, response to that. Um, and of course, then we have, we have in Australia these think tanks, these right-wing think tanks that produce reports. And we were talking about this earlier today. What happens is then, again, there's a spike in the media attention. Five. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, so there is a spike in the media attention. <laughs> um, wow. Right. The next one I'm not going to talk about. This is, this is what our PM, basically our PM said that, you know, uh, all the countries around us are performing so well, we don't want to be the runt of the litter. Okay, fine. So again, uh, December, uh, which is the month that the report comes out, December reportage peaks. Um, so my frames, I'm not going to get through all this, but basically um, when, when I did the frame analysis, there, there were um, three, uh, three frames that were used across the newspapers. Um, counts and comparisons focused on quality, Criticisms, again, on quality. Contexts, uh, they focused on quality when they were referring to the reference societies, um, but on equity in terms of some of the other uh, contexts. Now, counts and comparisons that, that analyse PISA data to provide evidence for a particular point of view. Um, uh, criticisms, criticism of governments, of policy, of teachers, of unions, of schools. Um, also criticism of funding or criticism of not funding enough, funding too much. Um, and then um, the context looked at uh, reference societies and equity issues. Um, okay, so basically not, not all the news, but not each of the um, newspaper corporations reported on these frames in the same uh, uh, amount. So basically you can see that uh, Seven West Media, pretty much level, but it was just one newspaper. You can see that the News Corp tended to have a greater number of evidence, you know, counts, comparisons, focusing on mean scores and quality, pretty much similar in the middle with criticisms, but the Fairfax media um, quite a bit higher in terms of the, the, um, the equity frames and looking at contexts. Um, so, if you look at this breakdown, you can see, again, I've divided up the newspapers, you can see that um, the Fairfax media, um, there is a little bit of a focus there, or, or a, a, while the, the spread is more even, you can also see that up the top, looking at the equity-related issues seems to be uh, of greater focus when you compare that to the News Limited, where seems to be a lot of blue there, a lot of focus on averages and um, mean scores. So I will just skip down to the bottom here. So this is a syndicated journal, a syndicated um, commentator, <laughs> and he makes the comment. Uh, you can see how influential these tests are by looking at the media responses. So he, as an insider, is making this comment. So this is the first frame, counts and comparisons. So the breakdown of that, predominantly we see evidence. So in this frame, we use evidence, they use evidence to make particular claims. Very little highlighting success. Um, uh, it's, it's mainly uh, more uh, negative reportage. Um, so you can see here that um, this is the data that ranks 
Australia. So you can see here that based on the rankings, Australia is um, dropping. However, um, if we were to compare that, so I did a little an aside and I looked up the 32, there were 32 countries that were in, uh, that participated in PISA across uh, 2000 to 2014. This is, if I go back to the, the Australia's performing well, 2000, 2003, Australia's doing quite well, we get reports like this. The Australian students have ranked in the top rung of a pre prestigious international scorecard. Um, that hit page one. Now, I don't know what happens in other countries, but in Australia, you don't get page one stories related to education. If if a teacher or a principal has interfered with a child, it's page one. If uh, in our local, in our NAPLAN, if, if a particular um, school or, or a particular state does well or really poorly, that gets page one, but not much else. So this, this was a page one story. <coughs> Australian, Australia's education system gets full marks. They love those puns. There is that, that very much the, yeah. And then this is typical of the rundown that you get. So only Finland has a significantly higher reading level. Only four countries um, in the PISA study were significantly better at mathematics. Hong Kong, China, Finland, South Korea, and the Netherlands. And in scientific literacy, Australia ranked behind Finland, Japan, Hong Kong, China, and South Korea, and came just after these countries on problem solving. So that's the type of reporting that you that you get. This was when Australia was doing well. Um, now this is where I skipped to, so now we come back to that. Uh, as I said, um, the number of participating countries has varied, but when I looked at how many countries participated in all uh, of the, in each of these years, basically there were 32. Now, that, in, that excludes the UK and the US because there was a year where there was problem with the printing and so all those little hiccups, I excluded those countries because I didn't have data across um, each of the years. And so um, what doesn't really get acknowledged is that more and more countries are participating in PISA. So when the ranks are um, put up, this very rarely gets acknowledged in the press. And so I did my own little study. So I've compared those 32 countries and the blue, you can see Australia's performance just based on those 32 countries and the orange is based on the entire cohort for that particular year. So you can see the results are a little bit different. I fully acknowledge that what I did was just as arbitrary as what um, the, the media are doing or, or yeah, people elsewhere are doing in providing these ranks, but why is this rank not any better than, than what else is being done? So I move into the next frame, which is criticisms. Often criticisms, and quite interestingly, is, it's of government and policy. Um, I say quite interestingly because elsewhere, three minutes, okay, elsewhere um, in another study I did, teachers, teachers were the ones that, that were um, bombarded and, and quite, there was a lot of criticism of teachers um, in, in the press. Um, so this is one perspective. Um, throwing money at students doesn't automatically lift their performance. A prevailing myth of Australia's left-leaning education establishments is that increased funding of government schools leads to improved educational outcome. Analysis of the OECD's program for international student assessment, international tests across the past 14 years, however, shows increasing expenditure is not the solution. So in terms of these criticism frames, that's, that's the type of thing that we encountered. And the other thing was making comparisons between our national test and PISA. I won't read that. 
Um, the final frame looks at context. And this is basically inequality was foregrounded in these frames, but then equally you get looking to Finland and looking to Asia. Um, and so if I, I did, I did a, so I looked at how many times these countries were referenced across all the um, newspaper texts, and it came, there were 573 instances of that. You see Finland, South Korea, Shanghai, Hong Kong, China, and Singapore being the top five that, that Australia is referenced against. And so Australian policymakers could learn much from China. We get that. That's the gist of um, some of the um, reportage. And our schooling sister, system is emphatically failing in one of its primary aims to overcome social disadvantage. The latest results from the OECD's testing program shows that demogra de uh, demography is still Destiny to uh, is still destiny in Australia. Coming from a poor family with low levels of education puts you as much as three years behind in school by the time you are 15. Then if you were born to affluent, university-educated parents, attending school in remote Australia means you trail your big city peers by almost two years. So reportage to that effect. So to conclude, OECD works assiduously to manage the media representation of PISA and the OECD media strategy seeks to mediate the mediatization of schooling um, policy but also contributes to it. Media coverage of Australia's PISA performance has increased over time and parallels the enhanced role of the OECD's education work in both global and national governance of schooling. Media framed PISA stories around the, category, the categories of counts, comparisons, criticism and context, focus on quality rather than equity, and there's a constitutive, uh, there's a uh, constitutive role played by the media in respect of Australia's changing piece of performance over time and this has policy effects. Thank you. Thank you.